Hello, I'm Laura Cassidy from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS's 256th National Meeting and Exposition in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Nanshu Liu from the University of Texas at Austin. She's studying a new generation of artificial retinas based on 2D materials. Dr. Liu? Thanks, Laura, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is my great pleasure to share with you our recent progress using 2D materials for soft conformable bioelectronics, especially soft artificial retinas. As we know, when people lose vision, um, that means their retina can no longer sense light or um, uh, vi visualize images. So the goal of this project is to build an artificial retina enabled by flexible electronics so that we can use those uh, photo transistors to measure light and then transform that signal to be electrical stimulations to stimulate our uh, optical nerves so that your brain can still perceive light just as if you can still sense light by your own retina. So artificial retina means that um, you have to have a very flexible, very soft sheet of uh, photo detectors that can conform to your eyeball. So our human eyeballs are really like very soft small balloon, and it's circular and it has a, a spherical uh, surface on the retina. And as you can see, our um, eyeball um, only has one lens, and therefore um, that requires a hemispherical eye, uh, hemispherical um, uh, phototransistor array to be able to um, see uh, things through only one lens. Um, but conventionally, um, those photo detectors are based on silicon wafers, as you can see on the left, um, on the right hand side. So if it's a silicon wafer embedded in your uh, retina, you can see because silicon wafer is so rigid and so flat, then it's actually um, distorting your um, natural retina a lot, basically making your natural retina flat. And that first is going to uh, have a flat image sensing array that's going to distort the image because you only have one lens, unlike your cameras, there are multiple lenses so that you can image by a flat um, uh, image array. But here, uh, we have one lens, so that really requires hemispherical image array. But if you use silicon, you can see that um, it's going to distort your image. And the second, um, because of the rigidity of this such kind of silicon uh, wafer, it's also going to damage your um, optical nerves in your long term. Uh, whereas if you can use relatively uh, soft and ultra thin uh, image array like in the two middle panels, then uh, you are uh, not going to distort the natural shape of a human retina, but in the meanwhile, um, you can provide uh, image sensing by this photo transistor array. However, we know that um, flexible electronics are able to wrap around a cylinder because they can bend. But it's very difficult for flexible electronics to wrap around a spherical, 3D spherical surface. Mm, just like a piece of paper, you cannot wrap perfectly because they are not stretchable, they are only flexible. So how, but we really need a, um, a high density array of uh, flexible phototransistors. So how do we conform to a 3D hemispherical surface? Well, uh, we got the idea, got the inspiration from our soccer ball. So if you um, take the top surface of a soccer ball and make it flat, you would see that it comes to this so-called truncated icosahedron design. And basically, it's like you are making some cuts into a flat sheet. And after you do the cuts, you can see from the numerical, stimula uh, numerical simulation in the bottom that this uh, truncated icosahedron design can f almost fully conform to a hemispherical dome surface, almost free, free of wrinkles or delaminations. And following this inspiration, uh, we built this um, um, 19 
135 phototransistor array onto almost just a one centimeter diameter uh, truncated exahedron sheet. And um, on this sheet, um, we have uh, MOS2 as the photosensitive semiconductor, and we have uh, graphene as the interconnects. The total thickness of this sheet is only uh, one micron, such that it um, can fully conform uh, without imposing any mechanical um, burden to our natural uh, retina. And using this kind of uh, high density photo transistor array, we are able to image um, external um, light stimulations and convert that into electrical stimulations. And we have uh, also like ultra soft and conformable electrical stimulators that can stimulate your optical nerve. And in the meanwhile, we are measuring the um, uh, brain wave, uh, which is called ECOG signal, using uh, brain electrodes, as you can see, those two gray ones. And when we deliver optical stimulation to a healthy um, uh, animal, like here we are using rat, you can measure those uh, elicited spikes and those frequency spectrum um, uh, signals measured from the visual cortex. And um, versus if we are uh, using only electrical stimulation onto the same animal, but the animal cannot receive light, you can see that the electrical stimulation can really mimic the optical stimulation in terms of your brain activity. So um, therefore, we prove that this could be a real artificial uh, retina by first sensing light and then converting the light to electrical signal, and then using this electrical signal to stimulate the optical nerves, and finally measuring your brain wave stimulated by those electrical signals, which can fully mimic the real light stimulation. And just as a dessert, we also put those two-dimensional material-based sensors on the surface of our face. So when our eyeball rotates up, down, and left, right, using uh, graphene-based electrodes, we can measure the um, surface potential from your uh, uh, face, which is called EOG, electrooculogram. That's your eyeball rotation-induced surface potential. And because it's using graphene, so uh, you can see at the the left lower left images that uh, even though the subject is wearing all those um, tattoo electronic tattoos you cannot see any of them because it's so transparent and so thin and therefore um, by using the EOG signal uh, we can develop an algorithm to control the drone flying so here you can see a laptop on the table and the laptop is receiving wireless EOG signals from the surface of the uh, electrodes and then the laptop runs the algorithm to control the drone so here the drone is flying according to the eyeball rotation of that subject if he looks up the drone would fly up. If he looks down, the drone would fly down. There is no camera on the drone. The drone is purely controlled by the laptop, which it was measuring the EOG signal from the surface of his face. And that's another example of a soft 2D material based um, bioelectronics. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, electronic tattoos and some of them ultra thin with silicon. And I just wonder why have you chosen graphene and this particular um, composition for your um, device? Sure, thank you for the great question. So um, currently there are many um, uh, possible materials that can be used in electronic tattoos. The reason we choose 2D materials are um, uh, multifaceted. Uh, first of all, 2D materials is a big family of materials. There are graphene as the conductors, MOS2 as semiconductors, uh, and HBN as dielectrics. So um, they show great potential of all 2D um, um, active electronic electronics in the future with total thickness, you know, only on the order of 10 nanometer or so. So uh, as you 
saw from my talk, uh, the thickness of our bioelectronics is really the key um, because our bio tissues are so soft and so delicate. Uh, if you use silicon, it's at least um, several hundred nanometers or usually several microns. In that case, um, they are very uh, rigid and, and uh, impose a lot of stresses to the bio tissue, especially like ultra thin retina. In that case, it's going to distort the retina a lot and also uh, mechanically damage the retina. That's the first because they are um, uh, very uh, thin and uh, very conformable to like 3D bio surfaces. The second reason is that Compared with the um, like most popular semiconductor like silicon, uh, 2D materials are mechanically more robust. Silicon usually ruptures at about 1% strain, but 2D materials can um, uh, be stretchable more than um, 2 or 4% uh, depending on the lattice. And also 2D materials are um, easier to pattern. So um, the way like we make those uh, e-tattoos are not by photolithography, which is uh, like a wet and expensive process. Uh, here we are uh, using a so-called uh, cut and paste process. So um, we transfer the graphene onto PMMA by etching away the copper. And then we are literally using a mechanical cutter plotter that's developed for paper arts. So instead of cutting paper, we are using them to cut the graphene PMMA sheet. And that can be produced within minutes. So it's really friendly for rapid prototyping. But you cannot use a mechanical blade to cut silicon. So this is another reason. Um, just to ask as well, how far have you got with the trials? I know you showed the picture of the rat, mm -hmm. but have you used it in any other mad animal models? Have you used it in people at all yet? Or when will those things happen? Right. So far, we only worked with rats. Um, that's because it's uh, easy to um, uh, operate on the rats, uh, including the eyeballs as well as the brains. Um, so uh, in the uh, current um, uh, system, we uh, not only have those uh, phototransistors, we also have those uh, electrical stimulators. We have designed a printed circuit board that does like analog to digital conversion and then um, control the amount of stimulation and so on. So um, the PCB has to hang outside of the rat. It's a pretty big one. And then there are wires running into the eyeball and the brain. So um, currently, um, this has to be a, um, like um, done in like gradual steps. Um, next step, we have to probably use monkey or some bigger animals, and then uh, hopefully one day human beings. Um, currently, uh, this kind of 2D materials are, like especially like MOS2, are still very expensive and um, um, tricky to fabricate. So the cost is uh, apparently much higher than silicon. Um, but we do see the potential of like super conformable and imperceptible um, bioelectronics. What's the actual surgical procedure to insert these retina then? How long would that take? And I mean, what sort of expertise would it require? Yeah, so um, currently uh, we are not directly doing those uh, um, like surgical procedures. They are done uh, in South Korea with our collaborators. So I don't know the details, like how long it would take to do the sur surgery. But uh, on rats, um, uh, whether the eyeballs or the brain implants are very standard procedures nowadays because they are used for many implantable trials. And just a last question to ask, how does it compare with um, human vision? I mean, you were talking about, um, you know, this, this is a better match, but do yeah. you have any idea? I mean, does he see in color? Is he stereoscopic vision? What type of vision is it? How does it compare and what are its limitations? Right. So uh, currently we are um, uh, uh, quite um, far away from the real human uh, vision uh, in terms of like pixels and also the color matching. Um, but we see that this is the first step uh, towards like um, ultimate like super high density and uh, like all color range kind of vision in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Katie. Katie Cottingham, ACS. 
So I was wondering, what other applications could this be used for besides, you know, powering the drone or as an artificial retina? Uh huh. So um, for those uh, um, electronic tattoos, um, they can measure all kinds of uh, surface potentials. So our human body is uh, full of surface potential. On the chest, it's called electrocardiogram. On any piece of muscle, on your arm, on your leg, on your shoulder, it's called electromyogram, and on your brain is called electroencephalogram. So those are just electrical potentials, electrical voltages. So using this kind of transparent graphene e tattoo, we can measure all kinds of those surface potentials. So um, this is showing the eyeball interaction with the um, a drone. And uh, you can even just use your arm to control a drone, or you can uh, speak. Uh, to control a drone, but not through your voice, but through your neck EMG. Because when you speak different words, we actually measure very distinctive uh, EMG signals from your neck. So then we can recognize what we are trying to speak, not through your voice, but through your neck EMG. And uh, those uh, graphene tattoos, we also demonstrated that you can use them to measure um, skin hydration, uh, skin temperature, and even like mechanical motion of your joints. So um, they are um, uh, like physiological sensors. Um, you uh, can do a lot of different things depending on what you use, how you use the data. Doug, did you have a question? <laughs> you have the microphone. <laughs> no, okay. Ayla? Uh, Bela Buslik, ACS. Um, the, the structure, you've got this, uh, this essentially graphene uh, molybdenum disulfide heterostructure, and as I read the, the abstract, uh, there's gold and everything else. Is that a, a real two-dimensional structure, or, or, or like, like a matrix of some sort, uh, sorts, or is it really a kind of layer? In, uh, yeah. So um, the question is about the um, layered microstructure of our artificial retina. It is uh, like shown in figure C. It is indeed a multi-layer structure, like exactly like how you build a transistor in your silicon chip. It requires uh, interconnects, source and drain, uh, semiconductor, dielectric, gate. That's what's shown in this and, and the substrate. So it is a um, like multi-layer stack. But the key is that um, for each functional layer, the thickness is only several, uh, several nanometer. Therefore, the, uh, even though we stack like so many, probably um, seven or eight layers altogether, the total thickness is only one micron, whereas the diameter is one centimeter. So it's still like an ultra-flexible sheet. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the other question I've got is uh, you can send the signals to a, a, a circuit board and, yes. and all that. How close are you to, to be able to feed into a, a, a nerve that, uh, that was damaged by something or another? Uh, you know, people lose eyesight and, and, and eventually uh, things degrade and so forth, but uh, to be able to, uh, to, to see, or at least even rudimentarily, mm -hmm. you've got to be able to transmit it through the optic nerve or, or some fashion. Or, uh, yes. I can't just imagine that there, there's a wire bundle, bundle that you're going to stick in there that somehow uh, lodges in the brain. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, actually, uh, you are right. Currently, the challenge is not in the sensor part. It's actually in the uh, electronics processor part. So um, here you can see that it's a very uh, complex, like sensing, um, processing, stimulating measurement system, like we're drawing there. So it really requires a microcontroller unit to put everything together, and it has to run algorithms to process the signal and then convert it into electrical signals. So currently we can make the sensor part or the stimulator part really small and conformable, but we're still using conventional um, integrated circuit silicon chips for signal processing. Um, and uh, currently that is, uh, 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 I would say, also the power consuming and um, uh, like a 
form factor limiting um, uh, components. So um, to reduce that, those things, uh, we have to collaborate with uh, uh, IC designers to further integrate those uh, dis different discrete components into smaller and uh, less power consuming chips. Well, so we, what we're doing is really looking for, uh, for uh, uh, down to the molecular electronics level, like, like molecular computers where, where it, uh, it, it, it's the ultimate shrinkage. Yes, like um, there are a lot of people talking about using 2D materials also for like uh, quantum calculators and so on. Uh, it's uh, 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 definitely a very exciting like research area, um, but currently if you are talking about um, the uh, manufacturability, then uh, silicon ICs are still the choice. And uh, our current ICs actually are not reaching the limit in terms of power consumption and size. Actually, there are like uh, 3D structures and uh, there are like um, uh, accelerators that you can put onto the chips. So they can be uh, further shrunk and the power consumption can be further reduced. So there are rooms too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. The archived version of the session will soon be posted at bit.ly backslash ACS Live underscore Boston 2018. Please join us for our next press conference at 3 p.m. today on honoring Franco-American chemistry collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>